So we're bigger and better and back at the California Market Center on Wednesday, July 24th for the BizBash Live Los Angeles show. Have you secured your spot yet? Register now at bizbashlive.com forward slash Los Angeles with the code gather for special rates. Are you, are you a fan of nine, eight, 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 Okay, seven, so we're going yeah, 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 yeah. to... Welcome to Gather Geeks, a podcast by BizBash, the place where people passionate about meetings and events come together. Here are your hosts, BizBash CEO David Adler and Editor-in-Chief Beth Kormanick. Hi, David. Hey, Beth. Here we are, another Gather Geeks podcast. Our guest today is Joy Wallace of Miami-based Joy Wallace Catering and Design. A go-to caterer in South Florida, the company recently celebrated its 30th year in business. During that time, Joy says the company has catered for every president since Jimmy Carter, and clients have included Bloomingdale's nonprofits such as the Miami Heat Charitable Fund and social events, including one wedding where I just saw on Instagram... The desserts included fried Nutella and marshmallow sandwiches. So basically, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, David, you recorded this conversation on location at BizBash Live Florida, which took pay- place in May at the Fort Lauderdale Convention Center. That means there's some ambient sound in the background, but I think it creates a nice atmosphere. Yeah, no, you definitely get the sense that something is happening and it, you're at a live event, which is what we talk about all the time. Um, and I thought that uh, we, we titled this thing The Joy of Catering, and you can see it and hear it in her voice. And also, it's interesting that she is trying to re-engineer how she looks at the world with her younger employees, and she's actually listening, and they're actually doing all these new, exciting things. And it felt like she was being reborn, in a sense, as a company after 30 years. Exactly. So we're going to hear more about that uh, as it relates to what it takes to last decades in this business, uh, as well as what she looks for hiring someone and more, as you said, about what she's learned from her younger employees. So let's listen. Joy Wallace, welcome to the Gather Geeks podcast. Thank you. I am here because I know you had a very special anniversary uh, of 30 years in business a few weeks ago. I did. And tell us what your journey was like. How do you, I mean, 30 years is a big deal. Oh, it was amazing. It was, a, it was an amazing event. It was so exciting. We had almost, well, between 500 and 600 people that came to the event. And, it, and people came from all over the country to the event. I'm on the um, uh, group of Leading Caterers of America, and so I have friends that are part of this Leading Caterers of America group, and they came from Vancouver, from Phoenix, from Los Angeles, from Connecticut, from Chicago, from Detroit, cities from all over the country. They were so excited to come to our party. Plus, they knew it would be something really special. Well, I figure really if unique. you can't do a great exactly. party for yourself, how can you do <laughs> exactly. a party and events for other people? Exactly. But let's go back 30 years ago. Yes. Uh, what year was that? That was 1981. 1981. What well, was... in 1981, I started working for another caterer. Okay. And then seven and a half years later, I went out on my own. So and that's the 1989, 1988, 19, 1988 and yes. it's 2019, 2019, yes. 2018. So what was it like in 1981? I was actually here too, <laughs> alive, <laughs> but most of these people in our room today are wrong. Well, there was not. another caterer in, in Miami at that time named uh, Jeans Catering. And Jeans Catering was somebody to look up to, somebody that you wanted to be like uh, was Jeans Catering. And so I, I got to the point where I competed with Gene, but in the meantime, he had had some Super Bowl parties and he asked me to be a ghost caterer for him because the parties were so big. So I would take tents from him that he, he, it was his name, but I was the ghost caterer. Oh, wow. So you did the work. That's what you call ghost catering. So, but things, so what was it, how did you get into this business? How did you, what was your love of food? Well, I love having parties. You did. It wasn't so much about loving food as it is loving parties. Oh, wow. And so where, you grew up here in the uh, South Florida no, area? Where did you grow up? No, no. I'm from all over. I was a military brat, oh, okay. military brat's child. And then I married, my husband was in the military. And so we traveled a lot. And I was born in Phoenix, Arizona. And my mother, on my dif- gift cert- birth certificate, said she was a m- resident of Phoenix 
two hours. She got off the train and had me because my father was being shipped to uh, Luke's Air Force Base in Phoenix. And she had me when she got off the train. So how did you find this love of parties? And I gatherings? love having parties. But how did you, when, I was always did, having parties at my house. But, but you were, when you were a child. Like we were from, what? I lived in Ohio for a while and we used to have potluck. Parties, your mother you, or your parents? Yes. Okay. And and our and I had friends who knew what potluck was, and we, so on Sunday afternoons, all of our friends would come over to our house, bring their own dish, favorite two dishes, and we would have a pot a potluck meal, and we'd play volleyball out on the street and hire babysitters for the to uh, for the kids in the swimming pool to watch the kids while we played volleyball and you know had a few drinks maybe. And so we, I just was always having parties. And so I, I found a handbook from FIU and Florida International University. Right. And I found a handbook and I, and I looked at the handbook and the courses that are offered and I found out that you could get paid to have parties. And I thought, that's so cool. So I told my husband, you know, you can get paid to have parties. I had never had a caterer. I didn't grow up rich. And I had no idea that there was such a thing as a caterer that you paid to do food or to do parties. So I went back to school at FIU. I had already been to school for speech and hearing therapy, but I didn't want to do that. And so I went back to school, got a degree in hospitality management at FIU, and went to work downtown Miami at the Miami Club. I don't know if you ever heard of the Miami Club downtown. No, I didn't hear no. of it. I didn't know it, but I, I take your word okay, for so it. I, went, and that I was, got the idea. That was in 81, Yeah, and it was an all-men's club at the time. So what did you do? What was your job? I, ever, I did everything. We started uh, the catering business together, and I purchased the food, and I was a hostess, and I, I, I did everything. I sold parties. And, but you knew it intuitively. And I ran parties. But you knew it intuitively. I knew how to do it intuitively because it was my instinct to yeah. be. I love serving people. I love the graciousness and the honor that I have in my life. I've served hundreds of thousands of people, and I think that to, to be a female and um, succeed in the catering business, which is pretty rare because most of the time it's men. Right. And to succeed in the business and to have the honor of catering. I've catered for every president since Jimmy Carter. I've catered for um, kings and queens and it's just a, an amazing life that I've had in this business. And it, And my husband was delighted not to have parties anymore at home. So that you can go outside and do yes. them for other people. And he didn't have to worry about getting the house ready or worry uh. about the food or worry about... But what is, what is your sort of principle of what makes a good party? Like, what is that... Well, people like always to have I mean, delicious it's in your, it's, food. But it's in your name. Yes. Yes. <laughs> my father named me that. Yeah. He said I was his little bundle of joy. Yeah. And that's how I got my name. But is that part... What is the fundamental party thing that makes... It's so much fun for you and the guests. I just love doing nice things for people, and and the fact that you can get paid to do it is pretty but, pretty but, nice. But, but dig a little deeper for me in terms of like what is the guest experience that you have created for them? Like what well, is your we're, magic? We're doing catering for weddings, and and special occasions, even if it's corporate, and. The person who hires us is trusting us to make their occasion the best that it can be. And I believe that we can make it the best that anybody could make it. And we get very involved in the people and in their lives. And we do tastings at our commissary right. with the brides, the grooms, the mothers, the fathers. And, I want to know and, what you, what you, like you look at something, like I want to get inside your brain <laughs> to figure out when you see something, what is good and what isn't good. Like what do you see as your, when you uh, create an event, like what is the fundamental thing that you know has to happen. Well, I want people to walk in and say, wow. Okay, so first impression. <laughs> Just wow, that first impression. They yeah. walk into the room or the tent. Most, well, most of the time we're in a tent. Uh, we're outside, we're outside catering. And they walk in and they go, wow. And what is in that tent that makes you go, wow? Is it the entire... Oh, because we don't have a hotel. Right. So we're not allowed to cater in a hotel. Right, but I mean, what, when you look in the, for the guest experience, when you walk into that room, 
when you see the wow, the lighting, what are you looking at? Are you looking lighting, at the lighting? Is I'm that the number one the thing? The lighting is magical. The lighting is the, the secret the, sauce? The decor. The, I think the lighting is like, I always say, like a woman's makeup. It just is the finishing touches. I know that our food is going to be delicious. Right. And our decor is beautiful. And the, just the colors in the room and the feeling and the atmosphere. When you walk into that room, that first impression, even music. Music is very, very important, too. And so you like to start out with music. You like to give them a drink and relax them. And, and it's magical. It's just magical to see an empty space turned into a, be- a place of beauty, like a beautiful garden, some place you walk into and you're just, wow, look at what that. About the te- I mean, I believe that the temporary setting, it is. It, 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 it democratizes a room pretty quickly because everybody is entering it using the same experience. Yes. So they, there's something about it that makes you talk to each other. Yes, and, and I've always insisted that we prepare the food on site, so we bring refrigerated trucks. And our core kitchen is in the refrigerated trucks so that you have salads, desserts, or we have people working inside a refrigerated truck so that the food is always cold that's supposed to be cold. Then we also bring a tent and we bring ovens and fry laters and tilt skillets. We set up a whole kitchen that night and break down a whole kitchen. So we're basically opening a restaurant and just the challenge of being able to feed like 800 people or whatever, even the small parties are, are, it's just that challenge to put your neck on the line, you know, like you're putting your neck on a guillotine to, to make sure that these clients are thrilled with you and the challenge. And then when you see their face, when they walk in the room, it's so rewarding. You just feel like, yes, I did it. So what about, you must be uh, a, a really good trainer of your team. How yes. do you, how do you, like, how do you get the discipline to make it my greatest gift that I have, and I believe, is looking somebody in the eye and knowing that this is a person I want to hire. Because I always have the most amazing team, and I can just sense when I look at somebody that they're a good person. So what is that? that they're dedicated. Okay, but what is, okay, how, where is that judgment? What is that? That's like the first impression, too. It is. Right? Is it, it you is. Know, do you know immediately? Immediately. And what about it? What is it? See this lovely girl here? Yes. Lo- we have one a, look. We're on a podcast, it so it's hard. Okay. Oh, lovely. First but look. what did you see? First, you look in the eyes? I look in their eyes. And in their eyes, what do you see? Well, first of all, eye contact is really yes. something that's a lost art. You, so you think the minute someone doesn't look in your eyes, yes. they, they're out? Yes. Really? That's, I know. That's a joy uh, I know. rule? Y- you just know. Okay. If they're looking me in the eye. Yeah. And what's next? And then their smile. Smile. Smile mm-hmm. is always good. Mm-hmm. And do you think that translates into... And their body language. It's all part It's all part of a package. But does it translate into capability? Of course. In most cases? But you I have- don't know. You can tell that they're intelligent. And I, I have... I know. Because the, and the people who work for me, I, I can tell that they are passionate. Don't forget to register for BizBash Live in Los Angeles. Join your fellow event pros on July 24th at the California Market Center for a day packed with ideas, inspiration, and so much more. It just won't be the same without you. Secure your spot today at bizbashlive.com forward slash Los Angeles with the code GATHER for special rates. Do you start with passion and personality? Yes. And then train? No, the eyes. I start with the eyes. Okay. You can see intelligence. You can see passion. You can see personality. You can see it all. What do you think about um, when you host an event? Look, look. We're looking at her eyes and we're saying, oh my God, you're hired. Look at when you hire her. Oh yeah, of course. (laughs) (laughs) We're looking at one of Joy's top people and uh, she hires with her eyes and Mm -hmm. it happens. Mm -hmm. How about, um, how do you train the host to be a good host at your events, even though you're going to give them all the things that you need? Because we tell them to spoil them, treat the guests like you would want to be treated. So this is another Joy rule? you're in your home. Yeah. And these guests are coming into your home. What would you do to make them happy? Right. So, are you training your clients to be better? Yes. Uh, is that part of your you have training? To. You yeah, have okay. to. 
And you, how, how do you have, you have clients that need work, that Sometimes need your tutelage? Sometimes people <laughs> ask for things that just aren't going to work. Like, like, you so, know, they want to put 500 people in a room that's too small yeah, for 500 you know people. Minutes, they want the seating more. and they insist that they can get all these people in there. It's for an example, they just, they just uh, are insisting that they can, that they, we can do this, but we can't do it. So you have to teach them uh, and gently as possible without making them feel bad right. that your, your thought isn't going to work. Right. And we have a CAD system, so we can we can actually put it in the computer and draw it for them. But but they just get stuck on things. Like, um, for instance, when you have a party for football players, they're not interested in vegan food. Yeah. But sometimes people want to serve vegan food right. to people who, you, you know, you just have to gently teach customers sometimes. Right. Not all the time. We right. have a lot of very sophisticated clients, but sometimes you have to educate them. But you do it so that you make them feel like it was their idea. They they understand, you know. I just, I, psychology was my favorite subject in school. So let's play a little game. Okay. If we have for 30 years anniversary. Yes. 30 years ago, what was it like for the menu? Was it a different menu completely? You know, it's really not. People still love tenderloin. They will still love fish. They still love lobster. Um, the, it, that hasn't changed. What about appetizers? Like they become more complex. Very no. much so. Yeah. Um, they're more artistic now yes. than they were. It, it's always fruit cup is out. <laughs> what? Fruit cup. I remember. Oh, no, no I remember at, a, at, a, at, a, at an event <laughs> where they showed the menu from 1980 and 2010 or something, and they had fruit cup it was the appetizer. It was the it was the, it was remember, the first course? I remember. Yes, and we try not to serve chicken very often because I like to be different. I don't want to be like anybody else. I want to be different, and so we try not to serve chicken. And if we do, we try to serve it in a different way. What has so now? This is only ten years old, but what has social media done to the way you look at the world uh, in terms changed of events? Changed the world. And what? How has it, it has, changed what it you do? It has definitely changed the world. Has it made uh, changed it, our world? It's, has it made the guest, the attendee, more uh, made the attendee smarter uh, because they they know more? Uh, oh, I think all the food channels has made them smarter. Yeah, yeah. And watching it, watching the food channels, yes. but the social media—it's. I didn't realize. It took me a while to realize how important it was. I have a lot of young people who work for me. They're all. They're. They're all. Well, of course, I love having young people. You can learn so much oh, from yeah, them. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, my my number one thing is take a twenty-seven-year-old to lunch. You exactly. learn more in two <laughs> exactly. hours than you learn in, exactly. a, in a year. And, we, you know, we were kind of like not a, not staying up with the popularity that we'd always enjoyed. And, and they said, well, we've got to get more involved in social media. And I really, it took me a while to really understand how much difference it makes now. It's a huge, huge difference. And so I thought, I, you know, I found out, you know, you really do need somebody who's doing this all the time. And I, I thought we could do it in-house. Oh, yeah. It's hard. I really did. I didn't think I needed to spend the money to have somebody doing it, but I was wrong. Right, right. No, I think and you're 100% right. And it took me a while you're right, you're to wrong, right that it was wrong. You were wrong. I was wrong. <laughs> yeah. And I, yes, I was right that I was wrong, but I didn't know because I just didn't know as much about it. You know, I knew people were talking about. It. Then when Instagram came out, and I started talking to other people in the business industry, and they were telling me that their most of their clients were coming from Instagram. Yeah, no, it's it's changed the game completely. It's just a big now, difference. Now, will it be that way in the future? I don't know. Instagram is full of ads. You know, <laughs> the one thing we don't know is we don't know. Uh, exactly. Who one, knows what's next? Yeah, nobody knows what's next. But I have, I I did make the difference, and we're we actually rebranded our company. We got a new a whole new look in our company, and can't change the colors of the company, and started. With Instagram and started what, having What about someone. the colors that you? What what was the? How was the decision made to change the colors and why? Well, the young people in our company thought that we should change the font, that we should change the look 
of the company so that we looked like we were keeping up with the trends right. now right. rather than what had always been. Right. And, and that's, you know, as the owner and as somebody that's been doing this for 30 years, I try to always be open-minded, but it's, it's hard to let things go right. and go with the, with the with young people. But if, if you don't... So what, uh, let's play the 30-year game again. <clears throat> let me ask you about value. You get paid now more for your value than you did 30 years ago, or is it, has that changed at all? I mean, are you able to? Are people are okay paying uh, premium prices for quality? I've never been a bargain right. caterer. Right. Right. But I mean, but even then, there's a sort of. Do they appreciate the fact that you're getting the highest quality that you can get? Uh, like I always say, that the event industry, until budgets got bigger because of. Uh, amplification, we were in some ways sitting at the children's table for Thanksgiving, and now no longer. We're at the strategy table, we're at the brand table, we're everywhere. Um, have you seen that in your business? I assume you have. No. Um, are they, I think what, it, what they pay us now is relative to the finances, finances, <coughs> sorry. What they pay us now is still relative to the way it was in the beginning. Well, you're a premium uh, brand, so yes, you're always going to get that. And we always, and I yeah. always have been. Right, right, right. But the, even the like, I think that there is people in this world today. People are willing to pay even more for higher quality. There's a new, there's a new level of high quality. I think. I think so, but they've always been there. Yeah, no, they've always been there, but I think that because people appreciate quality, more people are willing to spend. I think more people have money now. That's true, that's a good point. It yeah. seems to me that, yeah. in, especially in Miami area. Yeah. Well, you went through, I mean, we all went through 2008, 2007. 2008, you know, we didn't know if we were even going to make it through it. Right, right. And it it's been so an uphill battle since then. Are you... And um, it, was, it took a long time yeah. to recover. Are you still nervous about that? I mean, are you sort of defensive in terms of the way you're growing your business because of uh, the you fear know, of that? This year, I don't know if it's because of the new branding. I don't know if it's because of Instagram. The things that we've done to change... But it is making a difference, and our sales are increasing. Yeah, and I've, I've got just such an amazing team that work with us, and I'm listening to what they're saying, which we do have to listen to the young people because it's, it's their world, you know. I don't want to ever seem like the old fogey that won't change, and it's making a difference. So I feel very positive about what's happening in my company. But from 2008 on, it was a climb. Yeah. It was it was a struggle because people weren't really thinking about having a party. All right. And those who did have a party got criticized. Right, right. People didn't even want people, you know, um, companies, corporations who wanted to have a gathering, had to do it almost incognito so that the press didn't come and say, "Oh, look how much money they're spending right, on right, a party." Right. So we went through a tough time. Right. But now, do you, what do you? What is your feeling? Let's end on sort of your feeling on the power of face to face. The what? The power of a face to face gathering. You can't do better than that. That's what I think they learned. Yeah. They were. They stopped having uh, conferences. They stopped having these events. And I think that they learned as we learned along with them the difference that it makes when you aren't getting this face to face contact. Right. And you don't get to go and listen to the experts at a conference. I love going to conferences, and I love listening to what I can learn. And we can always right, keep right. learning, no matter how long we've been in business. Yep, yep. There's always something to learn. Yep. And I think that that's turning around. Yeah. No, I think that building your intellectual capital mm -hmm. is, especially when you're busy every day drinking from a fire hose, <laughs> going to a conference and learning Absolutely. is investing in yourself. I like the way you said that. Yeah, that's great. So, Joy, uh, happy 30th. Thank you. Uh, hopefully there's many, many more Thank to come. Thank you. We're and looking forward to the next 30. Oh, yeah. Keep, keep, invite me to the, to, the, to the 60th. I will. Okay, thanks. All right, David, we're back in our podcast studio. What a gratifying experience it must have been for her to have looked up to someone in the business, then gotten a chance to work with them, and then eventually surpass them. 
Yeah, and she's also, I mean, she is my definition of a collaboration artist. And uh, I think that that came first, her love of people and how people gather and understanding sort of the psychology of it. Uh, she's one of the few caterers that I know that came up through that side of the business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the corollary, though, is, is if you've done that, you always have somebody who's gunning for your position, right? Yes, yes. So you have to find ways to, to reinvent yourself and, and to stay current. How hard do you think it is being a caterer today? I mean, you literally have to keep up with changing pace. Oh, I, well, you're also, you're not only uh, c catering, you're marketing. I mean, a, a caterer is like the ultimate marketer in a sense. It's part of the whole program. It's part of the experience. And it all has to be integrated together now. Where in the old days, you can have the caterer working on an island from the marketing company and the decor company and everyone else. And now everything is is like a fine orchestra. Right. And uh, for our listeners, you can see more of, about what the company does, including its design and that fried Nutella and marshmallow sandwiches I mentioned on the company's Instagram mm. <laughs> at A Joy Wallace. Great. So, Beth, what's going on at BizBash? Our editorial team is bringing coverage from all over the world. In the past week, we've brought to you stories from the Food and Wine Classic in Aspen, PCMA Educon on the West Coast, Twitter Beach at Can Lion, and World Pride in New York. So we are all over staying busy, bringing the best ideas from events across the globe. And everything morphs together anyway. I mean, people are t the idea is to peek over the fence to see what other people are doing to raise your standards. Uh, so before we end our podcast, we'd like to thank the people that helped get it out. Uh, and uh, first, let's thank Claire Hoffman, who handles our editorial duties for the podcast. Uh, Nick, Rebecca Pappas, who gets it out to you and distributes it through all the different various channels. And Dave Nelson, our producer, who puts it all together for us. So thank you guys. And what do we say now, Beth? Gather on. Gather on. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. We can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Player FM, Google Play, and Pocket Cast. Be sure to leave us a reading and review. It helps others discover the Gather Geeks podcast. We'd also love to hear from you. You can leave feedback on Twitter at Gather Geeks or leave us an email, gathergeeks at bizbash.com. We hope you'll join us again for the next episode of Gather Geeks. Until then, gather on.